Good afternoon. Um, my name is Rod Page. I'm the chair of the GBIF Science Committee. And I'm going to be chairing this, this afternoon's two sessions, uh, the first of which focuses on uh, GBIF's role in promoting excellence in biodiversity informatics. And the second session, uh, more or less, but not exactly corresponding to the coffee break, uh, is going to be giving you some demonstrations of the kind of uh, fun, innovative, and sometimes quite surprising things which can be done with GBIF mediated data. So for the first session, we're going to start off with uh, Tony Rees, who uh, most of you will have seen in action uh, <coughs> last night, receiving the E.B. Nielsen Prize, where we single-handedly double the total number of prizes that Tony has won in his lifetime. So we're very thrilled to have done that. Tony won the um, award for his contributions to biodiversity informatics, which are numerous and legion. They include uh, heavy involvement in OBIS, uh, the C-squares, um, geographic indexing tool, fuzzy matching for the taxonomic names, which causes so much grief, and the database with the acronym I'm still struggling to pronounce, Erming. Erming. It's, it's really simple, really. So we're going to start with Tony uh, Rees' pre presentation, and then we'll move on from that. Tony, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and good afternoon. So, t assuming I can make this work, Yes. So today I've uh, selected the four items which I put in my submission for the prize, uh, which span a period going back about 12 years. C-squares, uh, the, the OBIS system, which in many ways is a, a marine uh, equivalent to GBIF, a taxa match, which is for fuzzy matching for species names and genus names, and erming, the, the acronym which gives people so much trouble. Um, just think of worming without a W. And, you can, it has the advantage that you can Google it and nobody else has ever used it for anything else. So that's a good thing. So for the, the first two items really are looking back in time to 10 or 12 years ago. Um, so to some degree they're just legacy interests. So I, I would ask you to be kind when you look at what they do compared with what you can do today out of the box with wonderful portals, wonderful web GIS systems, amazing databases of which we've seen examples this morning and we'll see more this afternoon. Um, this is really going back to, well, 2002. Think of the internet, it's probably six years old. There are no data portals. There's your, your web browser, if you're me, was Netscape version 2, I think. There's no Google. It's like evolutionary time back in the Jurassic. Before the mammals have evolved, there's no flowering plants. But there's no dinosaurs either. There's, there's no gymnosperms. There's nothing really there. It's a blank canvas. And so we're trying to build some systems, some tools, to start to do this thing which doesn't yet have a name, probably, called biodiversity informatics. I just called it um, data management for biology. Sounded all right. So geographic data are a bit different to, to manage than the other types of data which, which are easy to index. You can put them into Excel spreadsheets and flat files and find what you want. Geographic data are, are two-dimensional. So um, lots of other things are one-dimensional, like people's age, people's date of birth, people's names, etc. Uh, and indexing is a really useful thing to do. Um, for example, you have the index of a book you have a reduced subset of all the terms in the book and the pages on which they occur. So really, you could throw the book away. You could say, does this book have any information about this term I'm interested in? Yes, no. If, if it says yes, you could say, ah, oh, and it's on page three, four, and five. And then you could plug in, you could turn the index around and say, show me what's on page three, four, and five. And you get quite a good summary of the, of the book. In fact, you could do that with Encyclopedia Britannica, which has 26 volumes, and then volume 27 is an index. You, everything you want is probably in the index. So a book index is really useful. It's data reduction. It's quick retrieval, quick search, quickly tells you whether there's data or terms or material of interest or not. Um, and one other thing with a book index is it's really just a continuous stream of words starting on page one and going to page 300 and something. So to be able to address it, you have to snip it up into chunks and give each chunk a number. So in book, it's a page, for example. With geographic information, we can't do that so easily because we have latitude first, then we have longitude second. So we actually got to query two indexes to find out our geographic information. And also, there's no preset way to bin, to slice up latitude into little chunks and longitude into other little chunks which everybody uses. However, um, 
for a long time, people have got over this problem using grids. So we've all seen grids, we've seen town plans, street maps, etc. This hotel is in square F5 or square A1. So once we have a grid, we've done the binning of the latitude and the longitude, we can give every, every square a unique identifier, and then we can just sort them in a linear sequence, doesn't really matter what it is, from A1 to F5, and we can find our data. And we can also do the reverse, we can, we can construct the index and turn it on its head and say, show me all the things which are in square F5. So this becomes a very good approach if we want to manage spatial data of any type, uh, biodiversity data in particular. Um, so I showed you an example of a local map. Um, there's lots of local maps. They all use their own numbering system. Data off the edge of the map can't be indexed. So there are problems with small-scale data maps if you try to enlarge them to cover the whole Earth. On the other hand, there are some people who've got indexes for the whole Earth, but they tend to have rather big squares, like 10 by 10 degrees, which is 1,000 kilometers. So people like the World Meteorological Organization, the WMO, have got grid squares where they can, they can group all their observations into a bin and put that in a file somewhere say, I want to find all the observations from square 1000, and I'm not interested in the others. So it's a good search and retrieval system, but it doesn't scale down to the smaller scale that biology and certain people may want. So what I did as I decided uh, in, when was it, 2001, I would, make, I would try to, to build something which would scale. So I started with the 10 by 10 degree squares and built a hierarchical uh, subdivision of them. So this is some examples of 10 by 10 degree squares across the USA. I did this for a presentation in Washington, so of course everything focused on Washington. Um, so there's, on the top there's some 10 by 10 squares, and then on the bottom image you can see how that goes down to a 5 by 5 square, a 1 by 1 square, so that's about 100 kilometers, and you can just keep going as far as you want with my C-squares notation. So the principle of C-squares then is that for any, you can punch in a latitude and longitude to a little converter and it'll convert it to a C-squares ID. Um, you just decide on what scale is interesting to do this for you. And the problem is if, you, if the scale is too small, you have to store lots and lots of squares. Uh, if it's too large, you can't get the spatial resolution for your queries. It turns out the sweet spot for global data is often around half, half a degree, which is 50 kilometers. So that gives you quite good resolution, sort of wraps around coastlines and things without having to store huge numbers of squares. And then you create an index of, of those squares and you can either have one square for a point, or you can have a whole set of points, or a polygon, which is a set of squares. And this is what I call a data, foot, data set footprint, or a C-squares string. So I built systems at my own agency which would store these C-squares strings for any data set, and also built a, a mapping utility, which you could send a string of squares across the web to my agency in Hobart, Tasmania, Australia, at the bottom of the earth, and in real time, semi-real time, you'd get back a map in your web browser. And in addition to the square IDs, you might just want to store presence or absence, or you might want to store some numeric values. So there's 10 records or 100 records in this square, or some probability. So they don't just have to be uh, binary. So I built this mapper for my own agency, and we, we send ships to sea, and we're interested in where, where's the ship been, where's it collected data. So this is the sort of system I was building in 2002 for a voyage of a particular ship. Um, it went out, it collected underway data, which is physical and chemical measurements, uh, and these are the squares where the data's from. So you can use this as a spatial search tool then. And for biodiversity, you can do something very similar with species point data. And so this is a very early map that we produced for OBIS. We had some data for a fish species, the, the John Dory, Zeus Faber, and a, a lot of lats and longs in the spreadsheet, basically. And so for the first time, it was easy to send this data across the web to something which would then generate a map for you. You didn't have to run any GIS software. You didn't have to know anything about spatial data, really. Or you, you lead, just needed a list of the squares. And um, I built this for OBIS, and OBIS said, well, this is all right for data except for around the poles, because the, the flat map, the square map, stretches out Antarctica and the polar regions in very unrealistic ways. Um, can you build something which better represents the polar regions? So I set to work, and I found a little utility, some freeware on the web, which would draw maps of planets. 
and, and render them in what's called, um, I've forgotten now, orthogonal perspective, something like this, as if they were viewed from space. And I thought, well, Earth is a planet, so we can just use this software, and instead of a, a map of Mars or the Moon, we can put in a map of Earth, and it'll wrap it around a globe for you. And you can tilt it, you can get it back in the browser, you can pan it, zoom it. So this is before Google Earth, and we built this in 2004, and I tried it yesterday, and it's still working. So I'm, I'm quite impressed that uh, software, you know, if you, if you get two or three years out of a piece of software, you're doing well. So here we are, ten years later, we can still make these maps. Uh, of course, nobody uses it for that anymore. They just go to Google Earth. And this is what I was saying before. You don't just have, have to have dots on a map, which are red dots. You can color them, color the squares according to probabilities or something like that. This is a project that I work with in Germany called Aquamaps. And their idea is that they get all the point data out of GBIF and OBIS and wherever they can. And then they look at the environmental parameters associated with where those points are. So this is ecological niche modeling, rather, rather simplistic, but it's basic, but it, it works. And they've done this for 17,000 marine species, of which this is just one. They encode them up with probabilities. So you can see that the probability of this species occurring, this, the ocean sunfish in uh, India is quite low, whereas in Australia it's quite high. And in fact, this is the largest um, bony fish in the world. And people in ocean racing, the yacht people, if they hit one of these, the, the yacht sinks. So these are very large fish, and it's good to know where they might be. So what Aquamaps has done is they've made 17,000 of these maps. They stack them all up, metaphorically speaking, and put a pin through them. So then you've got a, a C-squares um, map interface where you can click on a square and say, show me all the species where Aquamaps predicts th th these species will occur, maybe with a probability of more than 50% or something like that. So Aquamaps is still going. It's using C-squares. Most of the people who have used C-squares in the past have moved on because we have these wonderful systems now which, which are, do, do these things a lot better. I'm, I'm just showing you how this stuff evolved and how you solve a problem basically with, almost with, with bits of string and, and, and rubber bands when you have no tools. You have to build some tools. So there's a description of C-squares from 2003 where you can go if you really, really want to have a look and see how it works. Um, so, having built a system or two in my home agency, um, I realized I started to work with OBIS, and OBIS built a very primitive um, data search system where they had no central portal. There was just a website where you could enter a name and it would fire off a query against a lot of different remote data providers and wait for something to come back. Uh, so, I came up with this, with this idea that if you built an index of all the data points, so you, you knew what the names were, and you knew where they were, the square IDs. Um, you could then just query the index, and you'd get much better performance. And this is the model that I showed OBIS in 2003, and they said, well, this looks really good. Can you build it for us? So I said, probably. So I built it for OBIS. They put it into their system in 2004, and for the next six years, this was all the mapping and the spatial searching in OBIS ran off this system. And so it's only, it was only in 2010 when they had to produce a report for the Census of Marine Life, and it was a big, well-funded uh, launch of, of the Census of Marine Life in London that they, they actually decided they, they needed something more sophisticated. So this is the basic concept. So you move from a system on the left where you're just throwing a distributed query in real time at the remote providers to something where you've You've indexed all, all, all the data points, you've in, you know all the names, you know all the distributions. So you can do a lot of queries straight off the index. And of course, this is the way that GBIF and OBIS and all these big data aggregators work now because everybody realizes that the old system was too slow and primitive. But back then, this, this, this was a big innovation. So we were quite pleased in 2004 when we produced the first OBIS portal which had a clickable map to say, show me what lived here. I, don't, I think I'm right in saying that GBIF didn't have anything like this. And I showed this at a conference in Hamburg, which was the first time I met Donald Hoban. And he took me on one side and said, oh, I'm working for this project called GBIF. You know, come and have a look. We can plot a map of where humans live. And he showed me a map, and it had about 50 data points. So that was good. This is my first introduction to GBIF. I thought, GBIF? Who are they? <laughs> this is some upstart competitor to, to OBIS. Anyway, since then, I've been nicer, nicer to them. 
So again, this is something which got published. There's a description. You can have a look if you really want, but it's mostly for legacy interest. So I have a little time. So I'll, I'll spend a bit more time talking about my, my current research interests. And as well as the spatial side of things, um, in Australia, I, I run a, a database of marine species, uh, names and pictures and descriptions and that sort of thing. And one of the things I put into the data model was to trap all the queries that people type into the system when they're looking for data and whether they found anything. And uh, I quickly discovered that probably 10%, 15% of the species, of, of the queries, people were putting in a name and they weren't finding anything, weren't finding anything, even though there was data there which, which matched their query. And the reason was they couldn't spell it exactly right. So one letter mismatch in a scientific name meant that no data was retrieved. So this is a little summary of some of the types of mismatches. So Coelorhynchus is a genus of fishes. And is it spelt with an C-O-E, C-A-E? Is it R-I-N, R-H-I-N, R-H-Y-N? Is it I-S at the end, U-S at the end? You know, many, many things are possible, and only one of them is right. And unless you have some sort of fuzzy matching, all the others are are going to be disappointing when you when you search one of these systems. So similarly, here's a spe some species names examples which you could find in in the Ubio species list and other things. There's there Antarctica, you know, you, you find someone's just dropped a letter out. Flavio Lata means someone's put an extra letter in which wasn't there, and th this sort of thing happens quite a lot. So usually the problem is with web users who can't spell and the input name doesn't match the target name because the target name is spelled correctly. But sometimes it's the other way around. Sometimes the target name is misspelled and the user is using the correct spelling. Or sometimes they're both misspelled, which can be a good thing because then you find what you want. And it's also a problem for operations which do data aggregation. And I'm thinking of OBIS from my first experiences, but GBIF is the same and many other groups. So they get data from many different places and different Organizations may be using different spellings of the same name. They may think it's correct. It might be legitimate. There might be multiple spellings, or it might be mistakes. And so you end up with long lists of things which notionally are all different, but some of them are probably the same, and there's just a very small uh, discrepancy in the species name. So it's good to have some tools to basically address this. And with these tools, you have to look for different types of errors. So some of the errors a phonetic errors, which means like the Coelorhynchus example at the top, it, is it spelled O-E, is it spelled A-E, it sounds pretty much the same. So you can model these variants and put them into a little algorithm and, and make, a, make an algorithm which looks for phonetic errors. Um, that's actually quite easy and it's been done for almost 100 years. It's much harder to look for the non-phonetic errors where things don't actually sound the same. You can't model that. They're just accidental uh, extra letters, letters are missed out, letters are switched, um, whole letters are transposed, or whole syllables are transposed. And one of the uh, best approaches for that is a, an approach called edit distance, which measures the numbers of character differences between two words. Uh, the problem is edit distance is quite slow compared with phonetic matching. So there are some existing fuzzy match tools. Um, and the way we measure their performance is of two things called precision and recall. Precision is maybe you got what you want, but you also got lots of stuff that you didn't want. It's not very good at filtering out false hits. Recall is when you don't get what you want at all. So you can actually build an algorithm which has excellent recall but terrible precision. You could just return everything. So you're going to get what you wanted, but it's totally swamped by things you, you didn't want. Or you, you can build an algorithm which returns nothing. It'll have wonderful precision, no false hits, but it has terrible recall. You didn't get anything back. So trying to find the sweet spot of 100% precision, you, you get what you want every time, 100% recall, so the other way around, are you listening? 100% recall, you got what you wanted. 100% precision, you didn't get all the rubbish. So this, this, is the, this is the holy grail. And you're also trying to do this in reasonable time. Like, how long do you want? If you put in a, an input name and it's going to look against two, two million targets, 
you know, and it takes half a millisecond or something to, to, to do each test, that's going to take you 100 seconds. Nobody wants to wait 100 seconds. So you've got to find ways to make it quick. So in 2007, I started building algorithms and testing them and tuning them, which would do some of these things. And I'm trying to optimize recall. So I, I don't want to miss true hits if they're there. So I'm looking for phonetic matches. I'm looking for non-phonetic matches. I'm looking for close hits. I'm looking for distant hits, because some of the true hits are distant. Uh, looking for different types of characters which might be dropped or inserted, whatever. Species may have the wrong gender, so masculine species in a feminine genus, or you know, th this is quite common. Is it, you know, uh, Rosa canina or Rosa caninum, that sort of thing? And the error might be in the genus alone, or it might be so the genus, the species might be right, but the genus is wrong. Might be the other way around, or they might be both wrong, and you still want to find what you're looking for. Precision is is another area where a lot of these off-the-shelf algorithms fall down because th they might have good recall, they might give you back what you want, but they give you a lot of rubbish as well. So for precision, you're looking for different ways to filter out the things which probably are wrong, even though they have the same number of character errors as the right one. So basically for taxamatch, um, I use what are called heuristic rules. So you look at real data, you look at the patterns of errors in real data, and you just return matches which follow those patterns and you throw everything else away. And then there's a number of different optimizing tricks you can do. So for example, I can allow three characters or four characters to be wrong in a long word, but you don't want three characters to be wrong in a really short word that's only got three characters. Otherwise, all three character words which are ever used will all match each other. Another thing that I do is what I call result shaping. It's a sort of dynamic threshold. And I looked at the way that people use existing edit distance, and what they normally do is they look for, for close matches. They, they set a threshold of, say, one character difference or two. And if they don't find anything, they, they do the test again and look for three characters different. And if they don't find anything then, then they might look for four characters different. So what I decided to do was, was automate this. So I do a, I do a test, I, I bring back everything, but I hide the distant ones if there's a close one. And, so it's like a, like a noise gate which opens uh, only when needed. And the, the problem with a wide threshold is that you get more rubbish, so you want to try and keep the, the threshold tight. But then if you don't find anything, the algorithm will automatically open the gate a bit wider until it does find something. Another optimization is um, if you've got a genus name, you only test it against other genus names. You don't test it against higher taxa like orders or families or, or phyla or classes. And the last thing, which it isn't really part of Taxamatch itself, because you could put it into any search system, but it's often helpful to say, I don't want to search the whole list. I know my, my name is a mollusk. I know it's a higher plant. So just show me the matches in higher plants. And that's a really good way to get rid of false hits. The final thing is to make this thing happen in real, real time. And what I mean is, Someone types in the name and they want a result within a second or two. They don't want to wait 100 seconds. Or if you want to do a big deduplication task on 2 million names, you've got to test every name against every other name. So there's 2 million tests. That's a lot of tests. And that might take three months on a slow system. So you, you want to make this as fast as you can. So I've got some optimization here. First, the first one is just to look at the genus first, because there's a lot less genera in the world than there are our species. There's probably half a million genera, five million species. So there's a factor of 10 difference. So you can get a, a tenfold increase without, without really doing anything except trim off the species and, and first look for genera that match. And then you can use the error patterns which, uh, which I talked about before to say, well, you, it's, it's, it's actually quite quick to do, to, to do some matching looking for these error patterns compared with doing the, the real grunt edit distance tests. So if you can say, just don't test all these names because they don't look right anyway, it's not even worth testing them, you can save a lot of time. So I, I can get a 99-fold improvement or 100-fold improvement. In fact, that's even... If I can test one name instead of 100, I'm doing well. Uh, there's, a, there's a, even one more optimis, optimization that you can do, and you can say that I'll allow, 
any sort of error in the species, but I really want the genus to be almost right, or you can do it the other way around. And, and if you put that extra constraint in, so the genus or the species has to be a phonetic match, you can get another big increase in speed. So it's a rather complicated workflow, and I don't really want to go into it in any detail. But at the top left, we have the input name coming in. At the top right, we have a bucket of target names, which in my system is 2 million species, or half a million genera. And you peel off the genus portion, and in the, the left-hand blue box is the genus testing. Then if there's a species, uh, you pass it to the right-hand blue box and you test the species. Everything drops out at the bottom. It throws away what it thinks are false hits and gives you what it thinks are the, the true hits at the bottom right. So we can look at this in practice. My Erming database, which is what I'll talk about in a moment, um, as I say, it's got about 2 million species names, half, half a million genus names. So you can go to, you can Google Erming and say, where is the data access page for Erming? Here it is. You can find a name somewhere and say, I want to see, is this name correctly spelled or not? And I've just made up Homo sapiens as a misspelling of Homo sapiens. I put an error in the genus, I put an error in the species, I want to see what happens. I press the button saying check species names and within a second, in this case 0.7 of a second, it's done all the testing. So first of all it looks at the genus and there's an error in the genus uh, Hombo. It says the nearest, I, I didn't find an exact match for Hombo, the nearest I find was Homo but I also found these other things. Uh, maybe these are what you want as well. Then it looks for and then it only looks for species which nearly match those genera. And that way it, it says, well, the only thing I can find that's at all like sapient in any of those genera like Hombo is Homo sapiens. There's nothing else. And this is how it does it so quickly. In 0.7 of a second, it's, it's done all the pre-filtering, so it doesn't have to test very many names at all. It only tests 548 names at genus level out of half a million and it only tests 50 species epithets out of 2 million. So that's, that you can get some really good performance out of this. So there isn't quite a published description of Taxamatch yet. There was a poster that I made back in 2009 for the eBio system, eBiosphere meeting, I'm sorry, in London. Um, I've got a manuscript which has been very slow in gestation and some people in the room have reviewed it and said it's terrible and this needs fixing. I'm, I'm not looking at Rod Page here. But it's finally been accepted for PLOS One and it's coming out next week, in fact. And there's a website at my agency where you can find out more about how Taxamatch works if you really want to. So the nice thing about Taxamatch is that I've been mulling over for seven years how to make the algorithms work, how to tweak them, and I've been giving talks at small meetings like Tadwig and eBiosphere and so on. And I've met people who say, oh, this looks like a tool that would be really good to put into our system. So by the time I've got the manuscript out, there's about 30 systems around the world who are all using Taxamatch. One of them is the Taxonomic Name Resolution Service, the TNRS, in America for plants, the iPlant project. And I noticed there's a poster outside the door saying, we ran all our names through the iPlant TNRS to see if they were correctly spelled. Well, that's Taxamatch. Uh, the wor worms, the World Register of Marine Species, there's a little button to say, do you want to return fuzzy matches? And, and there's a little link underneath saying, about this. And if you click the link, it'll, it'll say, this is an idea that Tony Rees gave us. But nobody ever sees that. Okay, so that's, that's a bit about ta fuzzy matching. And um, GBIF have actually sponsored somebody to make a port of Taxamatch into um, PHP. And the Atlas of Living Australia sponsored someone to make a port of Taxamatch into Java, which is what they use. I'm not really sure whether they used behind the scenes for data cleaning or whether they're available on the user interface. So I probably need to bash somebody's head and say, are you using Taxamatch? And if not, why not? Okay, the final thing I want to mention is Erming, which is really what I spend most of my time doing at the moment when I'm not doing what my employer thinks I'm doing. And if you cast your mind back a bit to when we were talking about building an index for OBIS, we want two different things. We want geographic identifiers, so in, at that time it was the C-square IDs, and we want names, which are our taxonomic identifiers. So 
basically what this means is that any of these large data projects for biodiversity needs a taxonomic backbone. Um, we need to know when something is a synonym of something else, uh, if two things are variant spellings, which, which one are we going to use? And OBIS wanted to know other things as well. They wanted to know, is this a marine species? Because if it's not a marine species, we won't display it. Uh, is it. Is it an extant fish species? Because they wanted to hide fossils. And ideally, you want to build this, this reference taxonomy independently of the data that's coming in. Because that way you can show data gaps. You can say, we know there are 10 species of whales, uh, but at the moment there's two of them we don't have any data on. Um, it means when new data comes on, online, you know where to put it. And it also gives you an independent list of verified spellings where you can run fuzzy matching against because you know, or you hope you know, that this is, this is correct. You could do this with all the species, but there's a lot of species names. There's something like 1.9 million valid living species. There's another 200, 300,000 valid fossil species. Every species has two, three, four, five, sometimes 10 synonyms. So you've probably got a, a target of 5 million species names, if not more, maybe 10 million. Nobody knows. So as I said before, when I was talking about taxamatch, um, there's only sort of one-tenth as many genera as species. So I thought, well, Catalog of Life have been trying to do this, you know, for 10 years, whatever. They're still 70% of the way there. They're probably really 30% of the way there because they haven't counted all the synonyms and they haven't got any fossils in there. Uh, but there are already some lists of genera around. People have done all the work, but everything is not available in a single place. So in 2006, I foolishly said to Obis, well, I could build you an index of genera and add all the marine flags and all the extant fossil flags, and it'll take about three months. So here we are in 2014. <laughs> I'm still doing it. So I called it ERMING, the Interim Register of Marine and Non-Marine Genera. There's some history to that term, but I'll, I'll tell you over a cup of coffee if you want to know. Um, so as well as the names, I want more. I want the family allocations. I want to know if they're synonyms. I want to know if they're marine or non-marine. And so there are lots of lists of names, but sometimes or many times they don't have this information. So having the name is just the start. And marking it up, improving the quality of the content is, is a large task, and it's a task which is still going. Um, having the genera, though, you've done all the hard work of classifying everything and saying, is this a marine genus, is this a non-marine genus? So it's actually very easy then, if you've got some species lists, to just hook them in there. All the hard work is done. So you can get species lists from Catalogue of Life or museums or regional lists um, and put them in. It's not really been a, a high priority for me, but um, if they're available, I'll put them in. So you could say, well, how many, how many names are we talking about at the genus level? Again, nobody knows. Nobody's ever tabulated them. My guess is that there's about 500,000, half a million. At the moment, I've got nearly 470,000. So I've got over 90% of all the names, which I think is quite good. And I've got species names in there from wherever I can get them. Um, the entire database, which lives on my server in Hobart, but people can search it via the web. But I also give po copies to power users. So if, if, if an agency like Atlas of Living Australia or GB or OBIS or some of the other, these others want it, I just make a data dump for them. At the moment, it lives on my server in Hobart, but we're talking about moving it to Vliz in Belgium later this year. The main reason for that is that I'm about to take uh, early retirement from my agency, and I'd like someone else to look after it. So I can continue to edit it, but I don't have to worry about the IT side. And also, Vliz in Belgium all, already run the servers where Worms, the World Register of Marine Species is, 30 more taxonomic databases, and they also have all the OBIS data, which OBIS has to talk to this system quite a lot. So that seems to be uh, a good solution. So we can throw things at Erming, basically, and get back information about names. Are they correctly spelled? What family are, are they in? Are they a current name or a synonym? Are they marine or non-marine? Many things. Are they fossil? Are they ext um, some time ago, 12 months ago, two years ago, Rod Page uh, wrote a, a post to Taxacom saying, this is a really simple service. This is what biology needs, and it doesn't exist. And 
this is my answer. Well, it's, it sort of exists. Some of it exists. I'm building it. I'm, I'm on the case. So, I, again, I trap all the user queries to Erming like I do to my Australian Marine Species Database. And I was just having a look last week when I was preparing this slide. And I noticed someone had... So you can put in one name. You can put in a thousand names and just go, tell me what Erming knows about these names. And this person had just put three, three names in. Um, and I thought, well, I'll, I'll, I'll repeat their query and see what happens. So here are the three names. Aricidea in brackets, Mira, Catherine I, I don't know what it is. It's obviously a genus and a subgenus and a species name. So that they'd, they'd look for three species names. And so I thought, well, I'll just repeat their query and see what Erming tells me. So what it tells me, um, yep, is that for two of the, two of the names, Erming has an exact match, uh, Catherine I and Lopez I, that they're both polychaetes. So if you know Polychaetus is a sort of worm, so very appropriately, they're, they're in the worms database. That's a joke. Um, th they've got some flags. That an E means it, it's an extant species, M means it's a marine species, and both those names are actually synonyms according to the catalogue of life. Of, so they're old names which are not in use anymore, and Erming will tell you what the new name is on the right. And then for one name, here, uh, there we are, um, it said, it, basically, I run taxamatch automatically because it's a very small overhead when I'm putting names in, in into the Erming query. So for this one, it says there's no exact match, but there is a near match. Aricidea horikoshi with one eye instead of horikoshi with two eyes. So it's fairly obvious that that is what was intended, and someone can click that link and go and get information about that species. So that's an example of a species-level query. Uh, mainly, Erming is a most complete as a genus query. So you can do similar queries with genera, or you can just say, show me everything that's in there starting with M or something, which is what I did in this query. Uh, I won't go through in detail, but you can, you can have a look on the web. And you can think of use cases for, for this sort of thing. If you're trying to name new genera, you can see whether this name has been used before. Or you've got a whole, you've, you've got a database from somebody, you don't know what, you don't know what they are. You know, this will at least tell you what the genus is, even if Erming doesn't have the species. And another type of query you can do is you can query by author name. So I thought, who's, who's, uh, who's someone I can put in the hot seat? I thought, Rod Page. I, I'm sure I can put Page in and see if there's any homonyms of Page in my database in the author field. And so this is what I did. And uh, I found that there's somebody, some, a Mr. Page in the 1850s who was describing fossil myriapods. There's a a page in the 1950s who was describing some plants. Um, there's a page in the 1960s who was describing um, amoebas, and so on. So you, you can do various queries once you have the data. And I made all these queries available quite easily from the Erming homepage. And then you can do other functions too. You can just say, I want to see all the plants, all the phyla of plants, show me all the you know, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family stuff, the classic stuff. You can just say, I want, just want to throw my query at a certain group. You can just list out the homonyms. That's where the same name has been used for different things at different times. Uh, we could say, show me all the mollusks published in 1856. And you, know, you, can, you can design your own queries, particularly if you have a local dump of the data. There's many things you can do. So of course, th there's lots of things to do. This is an open-ended project. It, it wouldn't suffer if it had 10 people working on it full time instead of me doing part time. So if I want to carry on for 100 years, there's probably work to do. These are some of the things I want to do. I, I won't go through them all, except to, to, to mention that the fourth one down is talking about literature, because Rod Page here is very interested in linking names to taxonomic literature. He's using IDs which come from a database called ION, and I've done, started to do some cross-matching of Erming IDs to ION IDs, and then if we've got two bases which are using, two databases using the same identifiers, we can make nice crosswalks, and I can say, well, I don't have details on the literature, but Rod Page's database has, and here's, here's the link. There's a lot of species come online since 2006 when I started this, like the plant list has got a million plant names, so some of this stuff would be really good to get in. And it's nice to receive this award because it will give me some time. I can pay myself when I've retired from my agency to do some of these things or pay somebody else to help me. So Erming doesn't have any published descriptions in, in uh, the classic form, but 
the descriptions online in the Tadwig uh, database of information projects of, of the world. Um, there's the current location which you can find by Googling. And hopefully it will move to Vliz and have a home page there as well. So again, just like taxonomic match, the measure of this stuff is not really how clever it is or how clever I think it is. It's whether other people are using it. And it's nice to see that Erming is being used in a lot of different agencies and a lot of different systems because it's the first time anyone's really tried to produce a, a comprehensive catalog of all the genera in the world for plants, animals, viruses, prokaryotes, etc., and make some effort to put them all into a standard hierarchy. So just in conclusion, I've just shown you a brief glimpse of some of the tools. Most, mostly they're developed independently, but there is some sort of, there are some common threads. You know, I started off with the mapping stuff. I applied that to OBIS, then I discovered OBIS needed the taxonomic name stuff. So, you know, some of this stuff hangs together quite nicely. At the moment, I'm supplying Erming uh, to, to, uh, as a contribution to the GBIF taxonomic backbone. Uh, um, I, I thought that Erming would be the taxonomic backbone for all life, but everybody else thinks that of their systems as well. So we probably have to discuss a bit more how these things play nicely together. There is a project mostly in America called Global Names, which is trying to, claims to, trying to be a clearinghouse for names, just like GBIF is a clearinghouse for data points. And they, they should be able to set up services so that a new name comes into one part of the system and some other part of the system can automatically be alerted and everything happens by magic. But it doesn't really happen yet. And again, just as I mentioned before, there are people working with the taxonomic literature, which I don't really cover very much, but it would be really nice to just expand my thinking with Erming and, and, and build these these hot links straight from my system to some of these other systems where people have, have these other interests. So when I was walking out of the door to prepare this talk, I was leaving Australia. My wife had a shopping bag and it had this on it. I don't know what thin line is. Innovation is only useful if it benefits someone. So I like to think that it's not just innovation, it's, it's the uptake which is important and that people are actually deriving benefits from my tools. So I've got a long list of acknowledgements. A couple of people are possibly in the room, David Remsen somewhere, um, Rod Page somewhere. Um, Donald isn't mentioned by name, but the ALA is there because the ALA funded some of this work as well. And here are some links, or you can just Google everything and find it on the web. Thank you very much. Th thank you, Tony. That was great fun. Um, we have time for a couple of quick questions if anybody would like to ask Tony. Okay. Thank you, Tony. It was very interesting. Um, if we provide the catalog, okay, the the, uh, the the taxa match software will work with a with a customer catalog. Okay. Yes. Um, the way that I've worked with people in the past is that they I've given the source code to taxa match to them and showed them how to deploy it over their own catalog, and sometimes it it's needed to be rewritten in a different software language because I have, have it in an Oracle software language. But other people have made ports. So there's a port in PHP, a port in Ruby, a port in Java, possibly something else. So normally I interact with the programmers who look after the data. There is another model which um, I plan to doing and also Global Names are doing. They have local copies of Taxamatch which they can then point at different databases. So another way to do it would be to say, I want to give my database to global names. You already have Taxamatch, which can point to different things. Please add my data to, to your system. So there's two ways to do it. Joanne, yeah, sorry. Thanks, Joanne Daly, CSIRO. Tony, I was really interested to see your fuzzy matching, and we heard this morning from Steve Wilkinson in the UK that in the overseas territories, people were downloading you know, half a million records, but had to reject a lot of it because they couldn't identify the most contemporary name. Would, would your software have solved that problem? Is it a solution for the problem these people had? Um, Yes and no. Um, if the problem is a spelling error, then Taxamatch will help you. If the problem is that it's an out-of-date name, then you need a database of synonyms. And most of the synonyms I've got at the moment come from Catalog of Life. So if Catalog of Life has it 
marked as a synonym, you'll find it. If it doesn't, you won't. And that's, it's a separate type of problem and it needs extra, needs a different scale of effort for someone to actually compile all the synonyms and then put them in the database and point and text to match at them. So partly is the answer. Oh, did I miss you? I'm sorry. Hi, I'm, I'm Tanya Abramson from South Africa, from the Biodiversity Institute. And I, it's a, quite an amazing and uh, thrilling innovation from essentially an individual. And, and, and really want to congratulate you on that. And, but your, your uh, retirement imminent <clears throat> makes me want to ask the question about um, succession planning, about uh, transfer of skills and mentoring. Uh, etc cetera, etc cetera. and I wanted to just find out from you whether in in the last few years you have transferred I don't think one can ever transfer the kind of innovative brain that you've got but transferred some of the skills and understandings to a, at least a cater of younger people who will take up the cudgel when you are retired thanks okay well what I've tried to do is uh, interact quite personally with key developers of other systems who just I meet at meetings or they email me and I help them on a one-to-one -one basis. Another thing I've done is put quite a lot of documentation on the web, particularly for Taxamatch, to say if you want to deploy it, these are all the things that you have to put in, here's some sample data, if you have a problem, contact me. Um, OBIS is really, it has its own developer team, so it's, it's grown up and left the house. <laughs> I don't really have much to do with OBIS. C Squares is almost sort of legacy we keep the C-squared mapper going because there are a few users, but we don't put... If I was building a system today, I wouldn't use C-squared, but it's, it's there as a service. Um, the biggest problem is really erming because it's a big activity, and I'm probably the only person who really understands the data structure and, and its dependencies at the moment. So I have a succession plan, which is to talk and spend time with the developers at Blizz in Belgium, either by Skype or they're going to come to Australia for a few days, or I will go there. I talk to them anyway because they're looking after Worms and, and Obis, so I, we have a good relationship. And um, and it also it will evolve in in new directions because they have their own IT skills, they have their own. You know, I'm providing a a, a large block of content which they might want to take in new directions. They've got tools, they've got services which work over Worms, over uh, um, PESI and some of these other databases. It wouldn't be too hard for them to say, okay, we've got the content, we can just plug it in and put it all these services or build new services if people want services. So I'm hoping that, you know, just by making critical alliances and also by putting stuff on the web and by publishing, you know, some of the technical detail in papers that that I am covering this stuff. I'm conscious that, you know, there's a point where I want to walk away and spend time, you know, on the farm with the horses and not worry about whether this stuff will continue. Exactly, yes. So, so yes, and, and I was planning to retire next year, but I've brought that forward, so I'm actually retiring next month. But I'm going to carry on working from home. I'm going to use the GBIF money to set up a nice little home office, replace my work computer with something I have to pay for, and, and just carry on doing it as, a, as an interest activity rather than something I'm paid to do. It's a good question, though. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>